Okay, um, so yeah, it's a tutorial talk, so I'm just going to keep things reason hopefully reasonably simple. Um, I guess the starting point is that uh, many, of the optical, many of the devices that we're actually trying to make in the center, um, they involve the transfer of quantum information from an optical field to a material system, and hopefully, in many cases, back again. Um, so the sort of devices that we're talking about are things like optical memories, sources, interconnects, uh, certain detectors. Um, the, uh, the, the sort of technology is coming into how we're actually, you know, you can even think about these sort of spin qubits trying to connect the microwave fields just to do local um, networking within a, on a chip. But my main interest is uh, long range communications. And so, I guess so for me, the main motivation and the one that I guess will be stimulating most of what I'll be talking about today is what's going to take to build a quantum internet. Um, and so, let's make sure I know what I'm doing here. So, this is trying to encapsulate a lot of the things you might want to do. Um, so, for example, we might actually want to take. Uh, so the silicon quantum computing being developed uh, within the center, or um, uh, a superconducting quantum computer, and actually somehow couple that to an optical field. So that we can then take quantum information from these devices and send them along a, say, fiber network, for instance. Uh, I think Tim, yesterday, I'm afraid I missed your talk, Tim, I plane came in a bit late, uh, would have talked a bit about the sort of repeater type uh, concepts. Uh, on how we can actually extend the range of the optical communications beyond um, the sort of hundred, few hundred kilometers, which normally which will limit us due to loss. So uh, these, um, so basically, we're going to need these sort of quantum repeater stations. Um, we're also looking at in the center, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the slide. Next slide is actually developing quantum satellite to get long-range communications. Um, and then, yeah, so that we can sort of basically, the idea is we can hopefully be able to transmit and route confirmation over distances, uh, and then you see using these quantum interconnects, be able to connect them back up to people's quantum computers. Uh, you might also uh, use these sort of, these networks to, uh, for uh, distributed quantum sensing type applications. Now, the sort of devices, as I mentioned, the sources, memories, processes, and interconnects, um, so uh, I'll basically get on and try and describe what it's going to take to make these work. Um, uh, I guess, see, in terms of looking at those applications, that the one that's sort of driving things now in terms of my lab and the sort of the technology we're trying to develop uh, is around the application of actually using quantum memories in conjunction with satellites. Um, so uh, this has really been pushed along by uh, discussions and now uh, sort of, uh, planning with the German Aerospace Agency, DLR. We're also now having discussions with NASA. Um, with the concept, the long range concept, uh, long term concept, is to actually put a quantum memory on the satellite and have a, uh, a device where we can take quantum information uh, that's on a light field, beam it up to the satellite, actually store it in the quantum memory. Uh, hold it long enough that the, the memory, the satellite will actually orbit a significant different, uh, distance. Uh, so we actually have um, systems where we've got actually six hour coherence times. Uh, and so the idea is basically to make a quantum hard drive. Uh, and then the big challenge is to, to actually make this work. Uh, you need a lot of memory. So it's not a case of just being able to store a qubit. We need to be able to store uh, at least sort of mega qubits taking into account the sort of the, the losses in the, in the channels that we're dealing with. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the grand challenge um, that we're working on. But in the first instance, we're actually looking at a, a, a more modest um, objective, which is just to demonstrate that we can take, uh, ideally take quantum information, and actually just beam it down from the satellite and store it in the memory on the base station not worrying so much about the storage times or even the data storage capacity. It's just showing that we can take, in the first instance, just a, a classical light beam uh, and classical information on it, 
take, uh, put it down through the atmosphere and actually couple it into a memory and with a sufficient fidelity that we can sort of warrant then doing the, the rest of the research. So that, that is actually would be sort of tagged on to this uh, Qualsat mission that we've been planning with DLR. And this is actually the, the first sort of design of that satellite, which is the main component is a 20 centimeter telescope and all the gyros to actually point it. So, um, so Australia uh, would actually be building the payload uh, for that, the quantum optics payload for it. Uh, and DLR are really keen to sort of build the, the satellite and help run it. We'd also be building the base stations uh, in Australia. Um, and so the satellite would be for optical communications, testing those concepts, quantum communications, and we sort of come in with a memory as a uh, sort of proof of concept of the, the long-term goal of put, actually putting the memory in space. Um, so what do I hope to achieve in this talk? Well. Uh, when you're talking about sort of taking light and coupling with material systems, there's kind of a, uh, an endless choice of systems that we could choose. Um, you would have heard some already in the last couple of days. I'm actually very lucky that um, quite a few of the concepts and things were really brilliantly illustrated in the two invited talks uh, yesterday. Um, so um, you were actually exposed to a few uh, different examples that I'm not going to tackle today. But what I hope to achieve is basically I'm just going to hand wave my through, myself through what I think are the key concepts. Um, what we're trying to, you know, what exactly what are we doing when we're talking about doing a light matter interaction, transferring quantum information, um, and kind of provide you a, the, sort of the basis of understanding of the, some of the technological decisions we've made in the centre, uh, and hopefully give you the um, the ability to sort of participate in discussions of how we go forward. Um, so sort of what sort of decisions, I guess, in the communications uh, applications, so the long-range communications, quantum communications, the emphasis is, um, has been based on, the center has been based on using ensemble approaches rather than single side. Um, I guess in the long term, we've been thinking about, we, we're looking at using um, solar state ensembles rather than atomic ensembles, that there is a lot of work in the atomic ensembles, but at the moment, in terms of the quantum memory, um, the, the atomic ensembles are really about the really fantastic testbed for developing the pro memory protocols. And then the emphasis is to trying to take those protocols across to the solid state. And so I'll try and explain why uh, the solid state is the, the direction to go in, in terms of integration and long-term goals. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll be sort of covering why, why the particular uh, optical centres that we, we work with, which is the rare earths, and I'll try and give a, a good explanation of why they're, they're our choice. Okay. Um, so to wind this right back to really basic concepts, so when you're talking about light matter interaction, basically we've got a laser beam and we're going to shine it on an atom, or an atom-like system. So I'm just going to, basically what I'm putting up here is just a nice semi-classical picture of how to think about this. Uh, so if we just take our atom, it can be a whole range of quantum systems, but what I, just for simplicity, I've just given you an electron sitting in a square well potential. Um, now, um, so you've got your ground state and just your first excited state. So they're stationary states, they're eigenstates. Uh, but if we actually put the system into a superposition, uh, what's going to happen is that the electron density is going to slosh backwards and forwards. And it's going to do so at uh, a frequency given by the, the energy difference of the two levels. Um, now, that electron, you can, um, it's, it's oscillating. It's going to act as a source term in Maxwell's equations. It's going to radiate. Um, and you can, as everyone here will be fully aware, that we can basically take that, uh, the state of this two-level system and map it onto, a, onto a, the block sphere. Um, and now we can just think about how we might drive that. Uh, in most cases, the optical field uh, is the sort of gradients in the optical field are sufficiently small that it's uh, sufficient just to think about it as a, what the atom sees is just an electric field, just a constant electric field across the atom. And now if we just apply an AC electric field and if we're near resonance, we can actually drive that atom. Uh, again, you can sort of plot the, uh, 
the, the field onto that sphere and exactly what the electric field, this uh, resonant electric field is going to do, or near resonant electric field is going to do to the state of the iron uh, basically depends on the phase. So uh, the, the phase of the, the atom is basically uh, dictated by the angle around, uh, around the equator. Uh, and so whether the, the optical field is going to put energy into the atom or extract energy out basically just depends on the relative phase of the block vector in the driving field. Uh, and so that's, that's a semi-classical model for how to think about this. Semi-classical because I haven't talked about the fact that the actual light field is qu quantized. Uh, I don't need to, to say too much about quantizing the field other than what's missing from this. So if I, you can imagine if I put the block vector up into the excited state, um, it naturally you know, it's going to spontaneously emit. But this model does not include that. That actually comes about because, from the quantization of the field. So what's happening, you can think of sp the spontaneous emission is due to the vacuum state stimulating uh, the atom to radiate. And so that vacuum field is a, uh, only enters in when you actually quantize the field. And that's where uh, the main uh, aspect of the uh, uh, field quantization that I need to take into account for this talk. So I'm just going to keep it at this sort of level uh, in terms of description. Now, uh, Gerd, you did a fantastic job yesterday discussing the uh, sort of coupling the light field uh, to the dipole. I'm just going to very quickly uh, just uh, remind you of what the issue is, is that if we've got uh, an optical field, uh, it's going to have a, a mode which uh, in general is just not going to couple strongly to a dipole field. There's just a mode mismatch. Uh, and so we need to worry about the spatial mode of the light, we need to worry about the polarization, and also uh, sort of temporal spectral characteristics of the light field we're trying to couple in. And so, and, and so the problem is that if we're going to try and exchange confirmation from the light field to the atom, we're going to do it very poorly if we just simply take the simple-minded approach of pointing a laser at our atom. Um, and so the problem will be that, uh, so first of all, if the atom's in an excited state, it's going to radiate, it's very unlikely it's going to radiate into the mode of interest, it'll radiate into some other mode. Um, and the other is if we have a photon in the mode of interest, the probability of it being absorbed by the atom is going to be low. And so uh, a lot of what we have to do is basically solve that problem. Uh, that's uh, not always trivial. I guess I'd say that the, the two strategies that I tend to work with uh, really work, uh, on the, uh, we're either going to engineer the optical mode, and uh, go to, I mean, this is the parabolic mirror, or going to cavity QED. Um, or the other is we engineer the radiation mode of the absorber. And the simplest way of doing that is go to uh, an ensemble. Now, I'm just going to basically talk about. Uh, what we're doing in these two techniques, uh, and then ha how they relate to each other, and uh, talk a little bit about the benefits uh, and issues with the two strategies. Where do you, and where do you use them for what sort of device? Okay, so without going into any great detail of the cavity QED, basically if you put an atom, say a two-level atom, uh, into a cavity, and you increase the Q of the cavity, just basically, if you just keep on making, you increase the Q by increasing the reflectivity of the mirrors uh, and decrease the mode volume, you can uh, increase the interaction of the atom with the field. So basically, what you're doing is increasing, if you're putting a light into the cavity, uh, you're increasing the local field seen by the atom, and you can push up G. Uh, now, if you, uh, you can push it up sufficiently that the coupling to the, ca the cavity mode now exceeds uh, the emission of the atom into all other modes. Uh, and at that point, uh, we're at uh, a, we have strong coupling, and so this means that actually the, the photon will now, uh, the atom will now emit into the cavity mode uh, preferentially. You'll actually see this, uh, one of the key evidence that this is happening is that actually the lifetime of the atom will actually 
decrease. Uh, and substantially in many cases that, uh, that we're looking at. Um, and also, if we put a photon into the cavity mode, there's a now a high probability of being absorbed. Um, you can sort of do this in two regimes. I haven't talked about the output coupling from the cavity. So uh, you, can, you can achieve the strong coupling uh, in the weak cavity limit, which basically means that uh, the time that the atom takes to sort of decay is actually longer than the cavity ring down time. So you'll get a, a photon that the sort of spectral width of the photon will be dictated by the ring, the, the atomic lifetime, uh, as opposed to the cavity ring down. Uh, you can get to the good cavity limit, which is basically the photon is now. You can think of the photon bouncing, uh, being emitted by the atom into the cavity mode, and then being reabsorbed by the cavity mode, and basically having this hybrid um, situation. And then you'll actually see energy level splittings associated with that coupling. Uh, and that's the strong cavity limit. Now, uh, I'm going to focus a lot on the rare earths. And it turns out that it's actually pretty hard to get to the good, strong coupling good cavity limit, but I will talk a little bit about some of the research that people are doing in that area. OK, so the ensemble approach um, is simply you take your laser beam and you shine it into a large collection of atoms. Uh, now, the exciting light field is actually going to induce uh, a phase relationship between all the dipoles. Uh, and so if you actually remove the laser light, the, those atoms will continue to emit with that phase relationship, which is set up in such a way that it'll emit straight back into the mode. So that you can get very strong coupling into that between the material, the ensemble and the light, um, just because of this phase relationship. And uh, obviously it means that you need to have atoms which uh, maintain their phase, basically don't decay here uh, quickly. Um, now, one of the advantages um, oh, of the system is that uh, you can actually store a lot of modes. So one of the key differences between, say, the cavity system with a single atom in it and this ensemble is that for the single atom in the cavity, you basically can store one mode. You, know, you, you can excite the atom. You can store, say, one photon onto it. Um, whereas if you go to an ensemble approach, you actually have many, many atoms so that you can actually store many, many modes. So what's happening when you store one photon on the ensemble is that, that one photon is being absorbed by an atom. You don't know which atom. So it's actually a superposition of every possible atom having a, that interacts with the, the light having absorbed it and all the rest in the ground state. And so it's actually this, this massive uh, superposition state. Um, and, but what that means is you can store more than one photon. Uh, and uh, potentially, uh, if you actually sort of look at the physics of what we can achieve, or should be able to achieve, the uh, potentially you can get an ensemble where the, your the number of modes you can store is basically limited by the atomic number, but if you're taking the interactions between the ions, you can get storage densities of basically the volume divided by the wavelengths cubed. So it's, you can think about it as like a holographic memory, sort of the same sort of storage capacity as a holographic memory. So potentially in an ensemble, uh, you've got this huge data storage capacity. What you have lost is what, when the system is extremely linear. So what you've lost is the capacity to do sort of nonlinear type gate operations at the single photon level, which you can have if you're just dealing with a single atom. So with the ensembles, we're basically um, looking at a very linear system. We lose the ability to do deterministic gates, but what we gain is to be able to store um, multi-modes and a, you know, a lot of modes. Uh, you know, sort of giga qubit type storage capacities potentially. Um, and uh, this slide kind of sums it up that uh, with the cavity, we can get uh, high nonlinearity, which means we can do deterministic gates. You can make some nice triggerable single photon sources. So, quantum dots uh, sources are a good example of that. Um, but you can only store one mode. The data storage density tends to be low. Okay, we're only using one atom to store one, one qubit. The problem is all the infrastructure that you have around it to get the coupling. And so that it's actually, uh, it is difficult to conceive of how you can really get, um, scale this up to the sort of uh, megacubit, gigacubit type storage capacity, um, uh, given the, the volume that actually is required to get the, cup, the good coupling. Whereas this coupling kind of comes uh, for free with the ensembles, uh, it tends to be very linear, uh, we lose the deterministic gates. But we can store 
arbitrary light fields and have high data storage densities and strong coupling is easy. Now, I guess the way that I look about these two systems, it, it's, kind of, it's, it's comparing sort of linear optics with uh, uh, basically sort of deterministic quantum optics type schemes. Uh, and so if you take the sort of Jeremy O'Brien sort of approaches, you do not, if you can do things fast enough in sufficiently parallel operations, you can get away without being deterministic. And that, that's kind of the, um, the you know, sort of the repeater schemes and things like that that I'm looking at. Um, that's what we're considering with the, uh, with the ensembles. Uh, and obviously, you can sort of do a hybrid of the two. You can actually put your ensemble in the cavity. There are reasons to do that. Uh, for instance, if you actually want to push the non get achieve some sort of level of nonlinearity, uh, you can do that uh, using ensembles. And uh, in essence, this is the sort of thing that sort of Ben is doing with the uh, atomic ensembles. Uh, uh, and the other is that we basically just need it for impedance matching to imp basically improve our ability to get really good coupling into and out of the memory. Um, okay, so this is just me wanting to, this all sounds fine, but kind of in the real world, how do we build these, what are the issues when we start building these devices? Uh, and, and really what we've got to do is basically count all the modes that are actually in the system and think about how we're coupling to them. Um, so in my initial diagram of the cavity QED, we've sort of got the optical mode of the cavity, we've got this sort of uh, the input and output uh, modes of interest to the cavity. Uh, we have the, the atoms degree, um, two level atom, this degree of freedom there. But we now have to think about everything else. We have to think about all the other free space modes that the atom can either couple to or through scattering uh, in the optical system that we can uh, lose light to. Um, we have to start worrying about mechanical modes of the cavity structure, for instance. Uh, thermal states, the mirror might, you know, those sorts of things, all the degrees of freedom that are in the system which might come into play. Um, the, and of course, when you think, you think of the atom, okay, we've got the resonant levels that we're actually interested in. There are other internal degrees of freedom of the atom. We're going to be interest, uh, worried about emotional states uh, of the atom um, so that we don't want the atom moving. And this is, came up yesterday as one of the issues. Um, and uh, we're worried about the states of the surrounding environment. So if it's a trapped atom, we're worried about how it's interacting with the trap. In our case, if it's solid state, we're bringing into play uh, all the ways that the, the host material is going to couple to our optical site. Um, and so all this stuff brings you pain. Um, now, the other, if we go to ensembles, is now we're also having to worry about the fact that we've got to, we have interactions uh, between the ions. So in, in our case, I'm using ion, um, ions in a crystal. I am to get my memory, sort of the theoretical values of my memory storage capacity, I've got to start pushing these ions closer and closer together. At some point, they start interacting. And so this interaction basically will kill my data storage capacity. So that if I excite one ion, for instance, I might just end up with a delocalized system. So I, the photon comes in and it's absorbed by one atom, but it actually is now free to hop around the ensemble. So actually, that'll be a, uh, I've got to take those sorts of things into account. Um, the other is that it's a, uh, you know, other issues that when dealing with the host material for th things like phonons, so that any vibrations in the crystal are now going to cu can couple into the, into the optical site. Obviously, charge, noise, uh, magnetic fluctuations in the crystal, all of these things come into play. And so, uh, a lot of trying to develop these devices is trying to turn the, uh, all these uh, parasitic interactions off. Now, uh, the way that we're going sort of about this is. Uh, at least in my group, is we use rare earth ions. And the reason for using rare earth ions, you can just see from the electronic structure. So this is actually the electronic structure for prosodinium, but they're, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, what you have when you take a uh, three plus rare earth ion is you end up with a filled five P shell, then a filled five S shell, and inside that you've got the four F shell, which is the, actually the optic, optically active electrons. And so this is kind of sitting in the Faraday cage. And so the rare earth ions basically have the weakest, as a consequence of this, the weakest coupling to their environment of any of the optical sites that we know. Um, and so as a consequence, um, we get the longest uh, T2s, 
for the narrowest homogeneous line widths, they're sub 50 hertz. Um, so we get coherence times about 4.2 milliseconds. We can get extremely narrow and homogeneous line widths, uh, the narrowest in, I uh, think, of any optical center, uh, down to 15 megahertz for an inhomogeneous line. Um, so basically, that's the strain. It's not coupling strongly to the, to the crystal. Uh, we can get long hyperfine coherence times. So uh, just doing a straight sort of hard echo, we can, uh, we've got systems where we can get out to just, just under a minute. Uh, if we start now applying to, uh, uh, dynamic decoupling at a reasonably leisurely rate, we can push that out to six hours. And so this gives us the capacity to actually think about building these sort of long-term quantum memories. Um, the, there's virtually no spectral diffusion in these systems. So basically, if you look at a rare earth iron, its frequency is hard and fast. There, there's very little um, change in the iron's frequency uh, over time, which is quite different to a lot of the other optical centers. Um, and I, one of the interesting things is that uh, you can work with concentrations from single sites all the way through to stoichiometric. So, and, and we are doing that in the center. Uh, well, single site, yeah, we, have, we do have some single site work. Um, and part of the reason for that is because they're not coupled to their environment very strongly. It also means they don't couple to each other very strongly. So in a lot of these systems, we can actually uh, push them so that uh, they're there's a rare earth iron in every unit cell on the crystal, so you know, a fraction of a nanometer apart. And the main interaction we have is just dipole-dipole, which is, and we need that dipole because that's actually how we interact it with the light. Um, so um, as long as we keep the unit cell sufficiently big, we can limit it to dipole-dipole and not worry about things like exchange interaction. Uh, and so, that, uh, so that's the reason that we can actually work over this, this huge range. Um, so just the way that I want to just finish up with this talk is just to start looking uh, at some examples of what we're doing uh, that covers these sort of three areas uh, of sort of concentrations. So the first is three-phase amplified spontaneous emission, which is basically an optical memory protocol and source. Um, and the next is work that's not going on in the centre, uh, but it's actually making uh, putting earth ions into micro cavities and working doing single site readout at this stage. So basically, they're, they're now talking to single sites and cavities. This is work at uh, Princeton and Caltech that I'm going to talk about. It's also work starting up in Sydney University with uh, John Bartholomew. Uh, and the final one is uh, our microwave optical conversion. And so this is where we're actually using the stoichiometric crystals uh, to uh, try and make an extremely efficient, uh, but also wide bandwidth microwave to optical frequency converter. So we take an optic microwave photon, convert it to an optical photon. And we want the bandwidth so that we actually have sufficient bandwidth to interact with uh, the photons that we can get out of a superconducting qubit. So we sort of want megahertz sort of bandwidth, and that's sort of what we're aiming for there. So that's work of uh, Rose Alifel and uh, Matt Barrington and Jevon Longdale at uh, Otago. So very quickly, um, with the uh, race scheme, it's a simply it's a very simple idea. You just take an ensemble of atoms and you invert the population. You've got an amplifier. Okay? What's going to happen is that the vacuum state will stimulate some emission uh, and you'll get a photon out. Or you'll get a light field out in, in, the, in the general case. Um, the, uh, then all we have to do is basically do an echo sequence. So we just apply a laser pulse and invert the population. We just apply a pi pulse. And the eye, what actually then happens is that all our dipoles, if we have inhomogeneous broadening, when the photon is emitted, um, it creates the coherence in the ensemble. So it makes the photon is uh, entangled with our amplifier. The pi pulse actually rephases all our dipoles. And so what we get uh, is if we get a photon, see a photon here, apply a control pulse here and flip the population, is that we'll get a second photon out. Uh, or an echo of the light field that we initially measured will come out uh, in a time symmetric so, um, uh, arrangement so that if, if there was a delay of tor here before we put the pi pulse on, we'll see that photon come out uh, time tor after the pulse. Uh, and at which point, if we've done this correctly, uh, then our ensemble should be back in the ground state and we should have two strongly entangled photons that are time separated. Um, now, I've Got it up there as photons, but in actual fact, um, it's, we tend to actually make uh, heterodyne homodyne measurements and we actually sort of 
uh, making uh, measurements on the field rather than actually counting photons. Um, so I've got. So sorry, I didn't mean to animate this. So I'll just get that up. Uh, what we do, uh, just to add complexity to it, is we actually use a four-level system. Well, what we do is we we have our amplifier, we get our photon. Then what we do is uh, the pi pulse actually comes in two stages. Now we apply a pi pulse to bring this population uh, down to here, and then we can actually. Uh, so at that point, our coherence is actually going to be sitting on these two lower states. Um, and then when we actually want to get the readout, we apply a second pi pulse and elevate this one uh, up to level four, uh, at which point we get the, the rephase in the second photon out. Now, the advantage of this scheme is twofold. is It actually eliminates some of the noise issues we have due to the control pulses. Uh, but the, the big one is that we can now actually store this entanglement on the spin state of the amplifier where we have these long coherence times. Um, and, yeah, okay. So the system that we're actually working on for the um, uh, satellite memory system and for the repeater memory system is Erbium uh, in YSO. Um, we go for time, a few minutes. Uh, so basically, the idea is that we just simply, uh, we've got Erbium, which is a transition 1550. Uh, we've got this hyperfine structure. This is in a relatively large field of about seven tesla. Um, what you see if you actually try exciting these transitions is basically this blue spectrum here, uh, which is if the population is evenly distributed amongst all the hyperfine levels. If we actually sit the laser here and just scan it backwards and forwards, we can actually optically pump everything to the top level. Uh, and so we can actually sort of prepare our ensemble very strongly. Then what you just see are the like-to-like -like transitions, which is this peak here. And this peak here is just a weak like to the uh, delta m, uh, m equals 1 transitions. And this little peak here is just due to isotopes. So we can basically prepare the ensemble very well. We can now do a tricks like optically pump uh, here to actually move population to different hyperfine levels to actually create the sort of features that we need for the, our ensemble. Um, this is just a quick example where we've just made a um, atomic frequency comb. Uh, we can get uh, quite high, we're getting sort of uh, 20 or so percent efficiency on the uh, atomic frequency comb. Uh, this feature actually stays around for the order of, of minutes. Um, and these are the sorts of structures that we're actually using to uh, implement the, the memory on. Um, and the key findings we've made so far are basically, uh, yes, we can, look, using the atomic frequency comb, we've shown that we basically have a window of 100 megahertz to put our memory. And so effectively, we can go, we've got 100 megahertz, we can achieve, should be able to achieve 100 megahertz bandwidth memories. Um, the time that we can actually, the number of modes we can store is just basically dictated by how long we can wait before we put the pi pulse on for the rephasing the race. And it's sort of about 100 microseconds we've found, you know, as we've done these measurements. So actually, on a single memory unit, the system's capable of storing uh, about a thousand modes on every sort of uh, sort of pixel uh, of this device, and so that kind of gets us to the realm that we actually need for the first stage of um, the uh, memory scheme for the satellite, um, the first stage of the satellite program. We're currently only getting about 20% efficiency, so we're actually moving to optical cavities just to get the impedance matching right, uh, and hopefully pushing up the the um, uh, how are we going? About five minutes? Six minutes. Six minutes, okay. That should be. Cool, thanks. Um, so, what we're now working on is basically uh, developing the sort of integrated structures to build the, uh, the cavities and the other uh, devices we need to actually uh, operate these memories. But the two strategies are sort of, a, sort of the short term strategies to go to a sort of monolithic design. What we're working with is basically uh, that little yellow strip there is the crystal. Uh, this is a five millimeter polarizing beam splitter. And these are just optical fibers coming in through grin lenses. So this is the style of device that we're uh, building now. We're actually using polarizing beam splitters so we can get off axis pumping and things. Um, and, and these are, hopefully we're going to start, devices like this will be going in the cryostat very soon. And the other is that we've been developing uh, sort of waveguide, uh, different waveguide structures. The basic idea there is we have a passive core 
but we're actually enacting the rare earth ions in the substrate, and we're just uh, either in the substrate or in the cladding, and we're just looking at different waveguide um, structures to actually uh, get that um, to working. They've all got advantages and disadvantages in terms of short-term, long-term uh, goals. Um, if you have any questions about uh, the side of things, you should ask uh, Dr. Troy is, uh, in the audience. We'll be around for the, uh, for the workshop. Uh, and um, yeah. OK, so very briefly, um, this is work going uh, is not inside the center. Um, there's an opportunity to actually collaborate with John Bartholomew at Sydney University setting this up. This is looking at single sites in uh, micro cavities uh, or nano cavities. So this is, this is work at Caltech from Adrian Ferron's group. We basically have made a freestanding beam and then sort of carved up a grating into it so it looks like a, a tub or own chocolate bar. Uh, and they just basically got mirrors here and they just couple, focus light here and just couple into it. Um, and so they are, and these are other cavities that they're building, sort of ring cavity designs that they're also working on. And so just to give you an idea of where they're at, um, so they, they now can do the spectroscopy of single rare earth iron. Uh, they're looking at a terbium. Uh, they've got, they can do it, they can initialize it, so they can actually pump the uh, electron spin. Uh, and they're reading out the electron spin with a fidelity of about 95%. Uh, it's a very stable optical transition. The spin coherence times they're seeing are about 30 milliseconds. So one of the problems with the rare earths is that it's a big iron, you have a very strong um, uh, spin orbit coupling. So the uh, electron spins are never, are never going to be brilliant qubits for rare earth ions. Nuclear spins are, work well, but the electron spin tends to have a relatively short lifetime and coherence time. I think that they're seeing the lifetime is about a minute or so, but the coherence time is about 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds. So they're looking at basically now getting the stage where they can uh, get indistinguishable emission, uh, demonstrate that, and show that they can do joint measurements between two cavities. Um, and that, that's sort of where they're up to. Um, and that's work that uh, John Bartholomew was heavily involved in, and he's now setting up in Sydney University uh, to follow this, this work. So there's a really good opportunity to sort of collaborate uh, on that. The other work is at Princeton. Uh, this is Jeff Thompson, uh, Jeff Thompson's group. So he's taken a strategy similar to what we uh, developed many years ago, which is just the idea of putting, of evanescently coupling to the rare earth iron. Uh, in this case, he's got a silicon uh, microcavity, which he just drops onto the, uh, onto the crystal. Um, now, he's working with erbium. Um, I think from memory, he's now getting mid 90 So he's, again, can measure the electron, initialize electron spin, read out the electron spin of about a mid 90s fidelity, um, minute type lifetimes, uh, coherence times about 100 milliseconds from memory. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the systems are really they're looking really good. Uh, they're working in the strong coupling, but uh, weak. Uh, sorry, strong coupling, but uh, bad cavity limit. Um, for the rare earth ions, because the alignments are so narrow, it's actually getting to the good cavity limit is going to be really hard. But uh, that's, yeah, th this work is really, really exciting. OK, so the final one, uh, which I, one minute for all questions, very quickly. Um, so this is the idea of using the stoichiometric system. Uh, what we're doing is for the microwave conversion. The idea is that we actually have a crystal, which is sto stoichiometric and rare earth ions, erbium. So what we end up, and then cool it. And so we cool it down below the Curie temperature. Uh, so we get a magnetically ordered system. And now we're looking at the magnon resonances to couple into the microwaves. But it's also couples strongly to, uh, we have a strong optical transition, uh, extremely strong. It is basically 100% absorbing over a few microns. Um, and extremely narrow line widths. Uh, and so these are sort of devices which we're building in collaboration with Jevon Longdale, uh, who's uh, at Otago. And uh, just to give you, so this is work at uh, Otago where they've actually just demonstrated using uh, gadolinium vanadate. So gadolinium doesn't have the optical transition, but is a rare earth iron. Uh, and they're just showing that they actually can get into the ultra strong coupling limit where actually the coupling 
strength is actually larger than the resonant frequency of the, the microwaves. Uh, and now what, just to finish up, the work that's, we're actually working now with uh, uh, Hendrik Runner from Switzerland, uh, who's actually been looking at erbium lithium fluoride, doing neutron scattering experiments, and turned out his samples are brilliant. Uh, they're, uh, um, they were, even the one thing that we really needed was, had to be isotopically pure in lithium-7, that happened to be. So they uh, order anti ferromagnetically at 375 millikelvin. And the nice thing is that the uh, erbium lithium fluoride, so at low concentrations of erbium, it actually has the 15 megahertz line, which is the narrowest you get in any solid. What we're seeing in the stoichiometric is we're seeing line widths of about 800 megahertz. Uh, we actually think that's mainly hyperfine structure. It's really hard to measure these things because of the strong optical uh, absorption, which is strong over about a micron. To give you an idea, when you look at these sort of samples, uh, when you go through the line, you're actually seeing um, the refractive index actually changes by about 10%. <laughs> um, so it's, and we just do that by reflection. You just see that the intensity of the beam drops off. Uh, so actually, if we can approach these sorts of line widths, there is actually a chance that this will actually be a, a negative refractive index material. Um, th these are very, very exotic systems. Um, so anyhow, I'll just go to the final slide. And basically, uh, so I guess the main points, uh, the ability to, inter to exchange confirmation between optical and material systems is going to be essential for a quantum network. Um, you can either engineer the optical mode or use uh, or the radiation mode uh, by using ensembles. Uh, and the, I guess the reason we really like rare earth ions is the weak coupling to the environment, which actually allows you to work uh, over the full range of concentrations and uh, allow you to develop a whole range of devices which are actually compatible with each other. And so at that point, I'll finish. <laughs>